This is chapter 19 of Crimes Against Christmas. Boom, boom, boom! With Heather and Ferg of New Old Friends. It was 13 years ago to the day that we met in the foyer of the Theatre Royal Bar. Aww. Happy days. Happy days. Happy days. Not so happy days for Artridge, who has just learnt that Missy has been found lodged in Daisy the Cow's lower intestine. Whatever next. Chapter 19. The Swan of Rickenstein. I followed my own advice and returned to my room to brood. I wasn't thrilled with the outcome of my attempt to lure the killer into revealing themselves, but I had at least learned that neither the Duke nor Father Vickers were not so wedded to their suspicion of each other that they wouldn't spread the blame liberally. The accusations of Lady Duplanus and Turtle hadn't had any real bite behind them, but it did ignite a bit of fire in Michelle. Seeing the young lady take on the Duke with such absolute conviction and total lack of fear reminded me that I should not underestimate her, or her knowledge of chemistry. I allowed myself a light snack and a wee dram, as they say, and raised my glass to Missy. I don't know what it says about my character, that it was the maid's death which was the first to affect me on a personal level. Maybe it doesn't reflect well, but on reflection you surely have to give me points for my honesty, which probably counters any negative score for my lack of empathy, wouldn't you agree? I didn't wish ill on any of the deceased, but their deaths just didn't impact upon me emotionally. I'd no dealings with Betty at all, so beyond the shock and horror of the crime itself, I'd no personal investment. Drummer was a crass and wealthy American, and fucked if I know a rude and pompous Russian. I repeat, I didn't wish any of them hardship, awfully sorry they're dead and all the rest of it, but I wasn't shedding any tears either. Whereas... The worst one could say about poor Missy is that she wasn't particularly bright, which is hardly unforgivable. She had a pleasant face and a cheery way of carrying out her tasks. I'd found her to be a comfortably benign presence on this island of nightmares. I was sad to hear of her murder and horrified about how it had been achieved. I decided not to ask to see the body, not not because I was worried to give any credibility to the Duke's accusation and uh, not because I was scared of seeing yet another mangled body. I, I wasn't scared of anything. Peter Artridge is not the type of chap to be scared, OK? And if you've been going around spreading malicious rumours that I am, then let's jolly well put that to rest straight away. I'll allow that I was a tad nervous, fretful, timorous even, but, but scared. <laughs> Come on. I'd finished my memorial scotch and was beginning to ruminate on the matter at hand. Namely, who might have had a hand in these murders, and whether there was any chance remaining of me collecting the bauble-related bounty. It was past Christmas Eve, and I was none the wiser after all, when there was a sharp knock at the door. The knock was followed by one of those mysterious shrieks, and somehow my tumbler ended up smashed on the floor. This phantom shrieker is one of the many mysteries of the trip, and for my money, one better left unsolved. I composed myself, from the shock of hearing the shriek, you understand, not the shriek itself, and moved to the door. Who's there? I demanded, gripping my mirror blade in my pocket, lest this knock-knock turned out to be a killer joke. It's butler, sir. Please open the door. I opened the door no more than a crack to peer out, and there was Butler, still red-rimmed around his eyes, but now his pain was tempered with an expression of empathy. The reason for this was behind him. Lady de Planus was in a terrible state of anguish. I say behind him, but in truth she was behind, beside, and even through him in places, wildly grabbing, pushing and pulling at the man in a desperate display of distress. Sorry to break the agreement about keeping to ourselves, sir, but I didn't know who else who could help. As you can see, her ladyship is somewhat distraught, said Butler, managing to keep his tone admirably controlled given that he was attempting to contain a whirling human pinwheel of pain. He's gone! I can't find him, Artridge! wailed the dervish. I engaged the time-honoured protocol upon which any decent sort of chap reverts to when faced with a weeping woman. Namely, to fan her with one's arms ineffectually whilst cooing at her to calm down. Calm down? I began, opening with a well-known hit to get the crowd on side, before launching into some newer experimental stuff. What's the matter? Who's gone? Gone where? My Eddie. Eddie? Who the hell is this Eddie? Again, I was gripped by an angry thought that there was another person somewhere on the island. Then I remembered what had happened the last time. Eddie's not another damned cow, is he? Or one of the blasted chickens? How dare you! Lady de Planus's emotional state flicked instantly from anguish to anger, and I was grateful for the butler barricade between us. He filled me in on my mistake. Eddie's Lord de Planus, sir. Edward de Planus, he's missing, sir. 
Edward de Planis has disappeared? My mind was already considering the possibilities as I asked. It appears so, sir, Butler confirmed. My Eddie! Screeched the missing man's wife, her anger toggling back to despair. OK, calm down, Lady de Planis. Lucy. My arms began flapping and my mouth formed the words on muscle memory alone. H have you seen him since we were together in the parlour? No, he wasn't in our room and Butler says he's not in the kitchen, the hall or, or anywhere else downstairs. You've been to the Great Hall, Butler? Anyone there? No, sir, nobody at all. I wasn't looking for confirmation from Butler. I just wondered if he might have seen anyone on the way to or from destroying a decoration. No such luck, and his display in the parlour had me better disposed to believe he was innocent. Well, look. I placed my hands upon the shoulders of the quivering wreck at my door. He was pretty upset when he left, Lucy. Perhaps he's just gone for a walk around the island to cool off. No, you don't understand. He has taken his swimming cap and gone for a swim, but he should have been back long before now. Imparting this piece of information seemed to exhaust the last of her energy reserves. Lady de Planis finally slowed her frantic scrambling and sank to a seated position, her back resting against the wall. The wild waves replaced with little eddies of woe at the loss of her eddy. Well, perhaps he's still swimming, I suggested, working hard to keep my tone hopeful. Where does he swim? She looked up at me, her eyes gleaming from the tears but lit from within with such pride. He takes a whole lap of the island. He is wonderful. Oh, you should see him in the water. So graceful. Brenda and the fishermen call him the swan of Rickenstein when he strokes past their boats. Oh, my poor, poor Eddie. Why do I treat him so meanly? It's OK. Calm down. A final encore for the anthem from me. Let's get you settled in your room and Butler and I'll head down to the coast. I'm sure we'll find... Eddie, hale and hearty. He's probably just giving himself a little bit of time to cool off. This seemed to be enough to convince Lady de Planus, or perhaps the storm of her grief had simply blown itself out. Either way, she allowed Butler and I to lift her onto her feet and walk her, each of us supporting her on either side, back to her room. It was the mark of quite how subdued she was that, for the entire journey, even as we laid her onto her bed, not a single innuendo, double entendre or suggestive remark was spoken. I was almost insulted. As soon as we closed the door on Lady de Planus, the butler grabbed me by the arm. The quiet control and compassion he had commendably shown moments earlier had quite disappeared, and his eyes were wide and fearful. Sir, what are we going to do? He begged of me. I removed his hands from my arm, brushing at the tweed to smooth it, and fixed the blighter with a look which said, now, see here, I've just calmed down one hysteric and I've no time to be dealing with another, so buck your dashed ideas up, old chap. Quite a lot to convey with a glance, but it's all in the eyebrows. Whilst my mean was saying that, meanwhile, my mouth was saying, we do exactly what I said we'd do. We head to the coast and we'll find the planners licking his wounds. Come on, sir, you don't really believe that I'm ruined, done for. Ruined? Done for? What the blazes are you talking about, butler? He looked at me unsure whether to proceed, but I arranged my eloquent features into a suitably unthreatening expression, the sort of look that says, come on, old bean, you can trust Artred. He's an honourable sort of old stick. Besides, you've started now, may as well see it through. If you're involved in these murders somehow, better to tell me you know now, and I might be able to help you down the line. Again, it's all in the eyebrows. Although I did also articulate that last sentence in words, whether it was my mastery of non-verbal communication or my mastery of verbal communication, we may never know. But the point is, I got my message across. No, it's nothing to do with murders, or at least I hope it's not. I arched my left brow and tilted my head toward him. Go on, it clearly said, as did I. OK, but you have to know that none of this was my idea, he began. You've heard of the Fabergé eggs, the perfectly jewelled Easter gifts made by Peter Carl Fabergé for the wives and mothers of Russian Tsar Alexander III and Nicholas II. Of course I have, I snapped, irritated that I was being patronised about such things a second time. But Butler was too involved in his story to notice my annoyance and continued. But did you know that in 1888, Fabergé also created Alexander III three special Christmas decorations? The Fabergé baubles. One was smashed by young Nicholas. The other is held deep within the Kremlin. But the third... I'd heard all of this word for word just a few days ago. I took over from Butler, recalling as closely as I was able the words my mysterious visitor had used. 
The third was smuggled out of Russia during the revolution. It has been held in secret ever since by the Dukes of Richtenshan and is now in the care of the current Duke's heirs, Lord and Lady de Planis. Yes, yes, yes. What of it? The butler was flabbergasted by my unexpected ending of his tale. How do you know about the bauble? As I've noted, my deadline had passed and I highly doubted I was going to get my reward, so I told the butler how I came to be on the island. All of it. He heard me out, then confessed he'd been tasked by the planners to steal the bauble before 12pm on Christmas Eve. I was right. The theft would have been perpetrated by a light-fingered member of the household staff. Just because other events intervened, that should still score one for Artridge. Apparently, the Richtenshans were in bigger financial difficulties than I was, debts up to their eyeballs. The plan, such as Butler knew it, was for him to steal the bauble and the planners would get word to the rightful owners in Russia along with an international fence. He'd get a cut of the reward for secretly returning the bauble and the fence could also price up some other items while he was there. Well, that must be fucked to fino and crimine, I stated. As we've seen, nothing gets past Peter Artridge when it comes to art crime. Exactly, sir. So when they got bumped off, I started to panic. Well, that's what I was fighting with Deplanis about when you interrupted. Interesting. Well, let us see if we can't find Edward Deplanis and ask him what he has to say about all this then, shall we? I wasn't sure whether to trust the butler or not, but the presence of my shard of glass reassured me enough to complete the search of the island with him. We didn't find Deplanis, but we did find signs of a struggle in one of the coves. The sand was marked with many footprints and two ominous grooves that led to the sea as though someone's lifeless or unconscious body had been dragged into the water. We also found one of Deplanis' shoes nearby. It didn't look good, but with the absence of a body, I told Butler he was not to tell Lady Deplanis anything more than we hadn't found her husband. We returned to the house, and Butler went to give the agreed amount of news while I headed straight for the Great Hall. In my heart, I already knew what I'd find but I still held out hope I was wrong. A glance at the mantelpiece told me I was not. There were now only five decorations left. My legs failed me and I sat down heavily, my mind racing over every awful thing that had happened since my arrival here. Betty, beaten with a pipe. Drummer, drummed into a drum. Don Crimine, the crime lord, leaping off the roof. Fuck to Fino, merrily dancing and drugging herself to death. Poor Missy, murdered mid-milking. And now Lord Edward de Planus, the swan of Richtenshan, lost at sea. To make matters even more chilling, there were these infernal Christmas decorations counting off our deaths from twelve to one. It was at this moment, dear listener, that your faithful narrator, Peter Artridge, cracked the case. Fear not. I know your civilian minds may be some way behind me, but I will elucidate. The final clue I needed was that phrase 12 to 1. Where else does such a countdown occur? At Christmas, particularly? Plus, look at the deaths. We have pipes, drums, leaps, dances, milking and even swans. Oh, you must be with me by now. Come on! The 12 days of Christmas! I'd cracked the code. Six deaths and they all lined up with the missing ceramic trees. I glanced back at the mantelpiece. Something was wrong. There'd only been six deaths, yet there were just five ornaments left, meaning seven broken furs. I racked my brain for the next step in the sequence. Um, uh, Geese! Goose! Lucy Goosey Woo! Lady Deplanis was in danger. I sprinted out of the Great Hall, the door banging loudly against the wall as I left. My feet pounded up the staircase and I was calling out at the top of my voice, Lucy! Lady Deplanis! Inevitably, the furore I was causing drew cautious heads to peep out from behind half-closed doors. I saw Vickers and Michelle peering around their respective portals, and Duke Richenshan had come all the way out into the corridor, blocking my way with his cane. What the bloody hell are you shouting about, Artridge? I need to get past. I was shamefully out of breath. The hall was quite long and the staircase really impressive. I sucked in as much air as I could, but my words wouldn't come out quickly enough. Past me? Why? he demanded like an ogre in a nursery rhyme. Your daughter, the murderer. At this, Vickers launched himself out into the hallway, still fully togged up in his ten-tog tunic, arms aloft in victory. So I was right. The apple doesn't fall far from the misanthropic tree. Lady de Planis is the murderer. I was one generation out. Richton Shan didn't pay the priest any heed and kept his disdain directed at me. Pull yourself together, Artridge. Little Lucy wouldn't hurt a fly. You're a bloody idiot if you think... Shut up, both of you! I interrupted. 
She is not the murderer. She's the next victim. Michelle, check her room. Michelle looked at me with such worry in her face, I instantly regretted the situation I'd put her in. But this brief exchange had shown me that it could not be myself, Vickers or the Duke to do it. If, as I was certain, Lady Diplanus was dead on her bed, it was better she be found by someone above suspicion. Why me, Mr Archridge? She asked, looking up at me through her fringe. Because we all trust you, Michelle. I'm sorry. Michelle stepped out of her room and carefully shut the door, protectively telling Turtle to stay inside. She made her way past the padded form of the priest, around my still breathless form, and after a moment's doubt, the old duke raised his cane blockade to let her through. She opened the door to the Diplanus' bedroom and entered, closing it behind her as she did. A moment later, she reappeared, ashen-faced, and announced, We're too late. She's gone. The duke howled like a wounded animal. No! Michelle moved quickly to comfort him. She looks peaceful, though, just laying on her bed as if she's drifted off to sleep. Laying on her bed? Of course. Geese are laying. My theory of the how was confirmed. Now I just needed to figure out the why and the who, and quickly. Things were starting to move faster and faster as we made our way down the list. I don't mind admitting that the presence of the pear trees in the orchard had not escaped the thoughts of one Mr P. Artridge Esquire. We know from social media that a few of you were ahead of Artridge with the code. Clever, clever. Clever sausages. Oh, little clever sausages. But have you figured out the killer? Not long till we find out. 